ladies and gentlemen, Richard Trumpka. Good evening. Thank you, John. Uh, I'll never be able to express how much I owe to you and how much the American labor movement owes to you for your leadership and for your friendship. And the Institute of Politics is very fortunate indeed to have you as a fellow this semester. Uh, and the students, uh, I can only say you've gotten one of the, the biggest treats that you ever get in your education because this man uh, is a visionary uh, and he's a friend to every American out there. John, thanks for all that you do. I want to add my thanks to the Institute of Politics and Bill Purcell for inviting me to be here with you tonight. Uh, I very much appreciate it. I'm going to talk tonight about anger and specifically the anger of working people. I want to explain why working people are right to be mad about what's happened to our economy and our country. And then I want to talk about why there's a difference between anger and hatred. See, there are forces in our country that are working hard to convert justifiable anger about an economy that only seems to work for those at the very top of the pyramid into racism and homophobic hate and violence directed at our president and heroes like Congressman John Lewis. Most of all, those forces of hate seek to divide working people, to turn our anger against each other. So I want to talk to you tonight about what I believe is the only way to fight the forces of hatred with a strong progressive tradition that includes working people in action organizing unions and organizing to elect public officials committed to bold action to address economic suffering. That progressive tradition has drawn its strength from an alliance of the poor and the middle class, everyone who works for a living. But the alliance between working people and public-minded intellectuals is also very crucial. It's about standing up to entrenched economic power and the complacency of the affluent. It's an alliance that depends on intellectuals being critics and not the servants of economic privilege. And I'm here tonight at the Kennedy School of Government to say that if you care about defending our country against the apostles of hate, you need to be part of the fight to rebuild a sustainable, high-wage economy built on good jobs. The kind of economy that can only exist when working men and working women have a real voice on the job. Now, our republic must once again offer working people something other than the dead-end choice between the failed agenda of greed and the voices of hate and division and violence. And public intellectuals have a responsibility to offer a better way. And today, and to, today the stakes just couldn't be higher. Mass unemployment, growing inequality, rising poverty, all threaten our democracy. We need to act, we need to act boldly, to strike at the roots of working people's anger and to shut down the forces of hatred and racism. We have to begin the conversation by talking about jobs, the 11 million missing jobs behind our unemployment rate of 9.7% and our underemployment rate of 16% or the African-American rate of 16.5% or teenagers, African-American teenagers, between 16 and 19 with a 41% unemployment rate. All teenagers at 24%. See now, 
you may think of yourself that you may think to yourself that this is pretty retro. Jobs are so 20th century. <laughs> Sweats for the gym, not the workplaces, right? See, for a generation, our intellectual culture has suggested that in the new global age, work is something someone else does. Someone we never met far away in an export processing zone will make our clothes. Immigrants with no rights in our political process or workplaces will cook our food and clean our clothes. And for the lucky 10% of our society, that has been the reality of globalization. Everything got cheaper and everything got easier. But for the rest of the country, economic reality has been something entirely different. It's meant trying to hold on to a good job in a grim game of musical chairs where every time the music stops, there were fewer good jobs and there were more people trying to get and keep them. Over the last decade, we've lost more than 5 million manufacturing jobs. A million of them professional and design jobs. And remember, with these lost jobs, manufacturing jobs, goes the R&D. That's which kept us competitive so far. We lost 20% of our corporate manufacturing jobs. We're losing high-tech jobs the very jobs that we were supposed to keep. For most of us, economic realities meant trying to pay for the ever more expensive education needed to pursue a good job. See, the cost of college degree has gone up more than 24% since 2000, while the average wage and average salaries have increased less than 1%. It's meant trying to pay for exorbitant health care as employer coverage went away or got hollowed out. It's meant trying to eke out a decent living, a decent retirement, even as the private sector shed real pensions and long-term investment returns evaporated. Meanwhile, Wall Street middlemen raked in the bonuses. And that was the reality for most Americans before, before the Great Recession began in 2007. Since then, we've lost 8 million jobs when the economy needed to add nearly 3 million more just to keep up with population growth. That's 11 million jobs missing. We used the public money to bail out the major banks, only to see those same banks return to the behavior that got us here in the first place. Aggressive risk taking in securities and derivative markets and handing out gigantic bonuses. Most galling of all, they used the funds that we gave them, courtesy of TARP and endless cheap credit from the Federal Reserve, to fight even the most modest common sense reforms of our financial system. President Obama's economic recovery program has done a lot of good for working people, creating or saving more than two million jobs. But the reality is that two million jobs is just 18% of the whole in our labor market. The jobs whole and the decades long stagnation in real wages are the source of the anger that echoes across our political landscape. People are incensed by the government's inability to halt massive job loss and declining living standards on the one hand, and the comparative case with which government led by both parties has made the world safe again for J.P. Morgan and Goldman and Sachs and Citigroup on the other hand. Rescuing the big banks hasn't done much for Main Street. The very same financial institutes that got bailed out have not only cut way back on the lending to business, they never stopped foreclosing on American family homes. 
You can expect to see two million more families foreclosed on in 2010 alone. The fact is that for a generation, we've built our economy on a lie that we can have a low-wage, high-consumption society and paper over the contradiction with cheap credit funded by our foreign trading partners and financial sector profits made by taking a cut of the flow of cheap credit. So now a lot of Americans are angry. And quite frankly, we should be angry. And just as we've seen throughout history, there are plenty of purveyors of hate and division looking to profit from that hurt and from that anger. And I try to be a student of history. And now is the time to remember our history as a nation. Remember that when President Franklin Roosevelt said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself, other voices were on the radio, voices that what we really needed to fear was each other, voices preaching anti-Semitism and Nazi-style racial hatred. Remember that when President John F. Kennedy stopped, uh, stepped off the plane in Dallas on November 22, 1963, radio voices were calling for violence against the President of the United States. And the violence came, and it took John and Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King and Medgar Evers and so many others. But in the United States, fortunately, we chose to turn away from the voices of hatred at those critical moments in the 20th century. Now, in much of Europe, racial hatred and political violence prevailed in response to the mass unemployment of the Great Depression. And in the end, we had to rescue those countries from fascism, from the horrible consequences of the failure of their societies to speak to the pain and to speak to the anger bred by mass unemployment. Why did our democracy endure through the Great Depression? Well, because working people discovered that it was possible to elect leaders who would fight for them and not for the financial barons who had brought on the catastrophe. Because our politics offered a real choice beside greed and beside hatred. Because our leaders inspired the confidence to reject hate and charted a path on higher ground through broadly shared prosperity. Now this is a similar moment. Our politics have been dominated by greed and the force of money for over a generation. Now amid the wreckage that came from that experiment, we hear the voices of hatred, of racism, of homophobia. At the moment of economic pain and anger, political intellectuals face a great choice, whether to be servants or critics of economic privilege. And I think that's a very important point to make here at Harvard. See, the economic elites at J.P. Morgan Chase and Goldman Sachs and the other big Wall Street banks are happy to hire intellectual servants wherever they can find them. But the stronger the alliance between intellectuals and the economic elites, the more forces of hatred, of anti-intellectualism, will grow. If you want to fight the forces of hatred, you have to help empower the forces of righteous anger. And at this moment, the labor movement is working to give voice to the justified anger of the American people. And quite frankly, we need help. We need public intellectuals who will help design the policies that will replace the bubble economy with a real, sustainable economy that works for all Americans. Working people want an economy that creates good jobs, where wealth is fairly shared, 
where the econ economic life of our nation is about solving big problems like the threat of climate change, rather than creating big problems like the foreclosure crisis. We know that growing in inequality undermines our ability to grow as a nation by squandering the talents and the contributions of our people and consigning entire communities to stagnation and failure. But despite our best efforts, we've endured a generation of stagnant wages and collapsing benefits. A generation where the labor movement has been much more about defense than about offense. We in the labor movement have to challenge ourselves to make our institutions into a voice for all working people. And we need to begin with jobs. 11 million missing jobs is simply not tolerable. That's why. That's why we're fighting for the AFL-CIO's five-point job program. Extending unemployment benefits, including COBRA health benefits for unemployed workers. Expanding federal infrastructure and green job investments. Dramatically increasing federal aid to state and local governments facing financial disaster. Creating jobs directly, especially in distressed communities. And finally, lending TARP money to small and mid-sized businesses that can't get credit because of the financial crisis. As we meet here tonight, organizers working for the AFL-CIO's three and a half million member community affiliate Working America are knocking on doors all across the country, talking to people about jobs. We're organizing support for Congressman George Miller's local Jobs for America Act that would target $100 billion in job creation dollars towards our country's hardest hit communities. To keep teachers in classrooms and first responders on the job. To create new jobs where Wall Street destroyed them. We're organizing support for financial reform and accountability for Wall Street. And we're working to counter the Glenn Beck effect and turn anger into action for real change. But we are not just talking about how to create jobs. We're also talking about how to pay for job creation. See, Wall Street should pay to clean up the mess that they made. And and we're responding and we're supporting four ways for the banks, the big banks to pay. First, with President Obama's bank tax, a special tax on bank bonuses, closing the carried interest loophole for hedge funds and private equity funds so that a man who made $4 billion last year pays at least the same tax rate that all of you pay. And most important, And most important, a financial transaction tax levied on all financial transactions, including derivatives, that would raise over $150 billion a year, according to the Congressional Budget Office. You see, the financial speculation tax would have negligible impact on long-term investors. It would be a quarter of a penny per share, but would discourage the short-termism in the capital markets that led to such destruction over the last decade. When it comes to creating jobs, see, some in Washington say, go slow. Take half steps. Don't spend real money. Don't really correct the problem. You see, those voices are harming millions of unemployed Americans and their families, and they're jeopardizing our economic recovery. See, it is responsible to have a pan, plan for paying for job creation over time. But it is bad economics and suicidal politics not to aggressively address the job crisis 
at a time of stubbornly high unemployment. In fact, budget deficits over the medium and long term will be worse if we allow the economy to slide into a long job stagnation. Unemployed workers don't pay taxes and they don't go shopping. Businesses without customers don't hire workers, they don't invest, and they don't pay taxes. But we also must do more, much more, to restore broadly shared prosperity. See, we must take action to restore workers' voices. The systemic silencing of America's workers by denying their freedom to form unions is at the heart of the disappearance of good jobs in America. We must pass the Employee Free Choice Act so that workers so that workers can have the chance to turn bad jobs into good jobs and so we can reduce the inequality which is undermining our country's prospect for a stable economic growth. History teaches that too. See, we must have an agenda for restoring American manufacturing, a combination of fair trade and currency policies, worker training, infrastructure investment, and regional development policies targeted to help economically distressed areas. We cannot be a prosperous middle-class society in a dynamic global economy without a healthy manufacturing sector. We must have an agenda to address the daily challenges that workers face on the job, to ensure safe and healthy workplaces and family-friendly work rules, and to prevent more disasters like we just witnessed at the Massey Mine in Montcoe, West Virginia. And we need comprehensive reform of our immigration policy based on ending exploitation and securing fairness working for an America where there's no second-class citizens. And each of these alliances, each of these initiatives should be rooted in a crucial alliance of the middle class and the poor, the majority of the American people. And those of us in the labor movement know that we can only achieve these great things if we work together with community partners who share our goals and with government leaders who share our vision. Government that acted in the interest of the majority of Americans has produced our greatest, greatest achievements. Think about that. The New Deal, the Great Society, the Civil Rights Movement, Social Security, Medicare, the Minimum Wage, the 40-hour work week, and the Voting Rights Act. This is what made the United States a beacon of hope in a confused and in a divided world. And in the end, I believe that the health care bill signed into law last month is an achievement on this very same order, and one that we can continue to improve upon to secure real quality health care for every American. But too many leaders thought, thought leaders have become the servants of a different kind of politics. A politics that sees Americans, middle class Americans, as overpaid and underworked. That sees Social Security as a problem rather than the piece of our retirement security that actually works. A mentality that feels sorry for homeless people but fails to see the connections between downsizing, outsourcing, inequality, and homelessness. A mentality that sees mass unemployment as something that will take care of itself eventually. We need to return to a, a different vision. President Obama said in his inaugural address that the state of the economy calls for action, bold and swift, and we will act not only to create new jobs, but to lay a new foundation for growth. 
Well, now is the time to make good on those words for Congress, for President Obama, and for the American people. See, these are big challenges, but it's long past time to take them on. If you're worried about the anger in our country, if you don't want the forces of hatred to grow, be part of the fight for economic justice and a new economic foundation for America. Be a critic of power and privilege, not its servant. Be the source of ideas that can rebuild our economy and restore confidence in government. As students, as teachers, as workers, all of us can play a role in this great effort. Whether here, within the university, at think tanks, in the government, in the press, or even working with us in the labor movement, working people need the help of engaged policy intellectuals if we are together going to build an economy that really does work for all Americans. Think about the great promise of America and the great legacy that we've inherited. Our wealth as a nation and our energy as a people can deliver. In the words of my predecessor, Samuel Gompers, we can deliver more schoolhouses and less jails, more books and less arsenals, more learning and less vice, more leisure and less greed, more justice and less revenge. In fact, more of the opportunities to cultivate our better natures. See, that's the American future the labor movement is working for. And let me be clear, there's no excuse for racism or hatred. All Americans need to unite against it. The labor movement must be a powerful voice against it. But you can't fight hatred with greed. Working people are angry, and we're right to be angry at the betrayal of our economic future. Help us turn anger into the energy to win a better country and a better world. Together, I know we can do it. Thank you very much.